We're living on a planet facing almost insurmountable challenges. Challenges we have to face sooner rather than later. The world needs our energy. She needs our ideas, our passion. It's up to us to change things, make a positive change to the planet, to feed the world, to protect the future, to live well, to be the generation that will make a change. Join us. This is the fourth of a series of six Changemaker lectures, and it's an initiative from the Lincoln University Professoriate, and I'm standing here as the chair of the Professoriate as your MC this evening. It's an initiative that's been worked with the communications team at Lincoln University to try and indicate to people how the university is engaged in um, feeding the world, protecting the future, and living well. And tonight's lecture is very much a reflection of that. Tonight we hear from Professor Grant Edwards. Um, Dr. Edwards is Professor of Dairy Production and the Dean of Faculty and the Interim Dean of the Faculty of Agriculture and Life Sciences. Grant comes to us from Wellsford off a dairy farm, so he's been exported from Northland to the South Island. He came down here and did his agricultural science degree um, with Dick Lucas and finished in 1990. And at that stage, Grant worked on um, grazing preference of animals and what they actually wanted to eat and really I think you've continued that theme through your career from um, the very first early days of him being an undergraduate uh, student here at the university but there were bigger things to come for Grant in 1991 he was a Rhodes Scholar and went to um, Oxford University to complete his Doctor of Philosophy in Behavioural Ecology and then he held um, teaching positions at Ag Research and Imperial College London and from a personal perspective, I was um, very pleased that Grant enjoyed his time in London because at that time I was finishing my PhD and we were both doing postdocs um, in the UK and Grant turned down a lecturing position at Lincoln and I decided that I'd take it. <laughs> and uh, so that was how I got my lecturing position. About 18 months later, uh, I think Grant joined us on staff as a lecturer in plant science and uh, we shared a, a corridor for a number of years before he um, moved to move to offices and became the, the head of animal science. He's now the professor of dairy production, um, which he was appointed in 2009, so your professorial address is well overdue. Um, where his interest in forages has remained, and I think tonight's presentation, Grant, will talk a lot about the things um, that have happened over the period that he's been involved in um, grazing management and looking at the dairy systems. Outside of work, um, Grant's developed a two hectare garden at Kiwi. I'm not sure where he finds time to do that, but he obviously does. Um, and he's also the men's, a, a selector for the men's New Zealand hockey team. And Grant, I just wanted to indicate that they did manage to win today. Yeah. So 9-0 against Brazil will make you feel better than some of the other last minute losses to Spain and things like that. So um, congratulations on, on the Canterbury Under-21 team, which are currently the New Zealand champions and Grant is the coach of those. So sit back and enjoy an in-depth look at the New Zealand dairy industry. Grant is one of the people that has led the place that Lincoln University holds in the dairy industry. A lot of people, both nationally and internationally, look at the Lincoln University dairy farm and the things that are happening on it to see how they can make change, to see how those changes are going to affect production, how those changes may affect the environment, and it really has become a leading um, part of the, Lincoln, um, the Lincoln's contribution to both the national and international uh, environment. And Grant is very much a part of leading that team. So Grant, I'll leave the floor to you and get you to give your uh, professorial address on the New Zealand dairy industry, friend or foe. Please welcome Grant Edwards. Uh, thank you, Derek, and uh, good evening to everyone. Um, tonight I'm going to um, examine some approaches for New Zealand dairy systems and look at approaches of how we've got to improve our productivity, profitability and to improve our environmental impact. In addressing this, I'm going to take you down a research continuum from component research through farm systems research full, uh, through to on-farm demonstration and tell you a bit of a story and about the journey that I think I've been on with others here at Lincoln University around this. First of all, a little bit about the dairy industry. It is a small industry internationally. So we produce about 3% of the world's milk. 
that comes from 5 million cows and it's, uh, they've uh, farmed on about 1.8 million hectares of land. And we produce about 21.3 billion litres of milk. It's an industry that's important for jobs in New Zealand. Just under 50,000 people work in actually on farm and in milk processing. And that excludes all the people that work in the allied industries like fertilizers and seeds and all those people in irrigation industries, etc. It doesn't include those. We've got 50,000 people. Of that milk that we produce, it's about 3% of the world's milk. But globally it's important, it's about 35% of the total traded um, of milk products come from New Zealand. So internationally, New Zealand's 3% is pretty significant. <laughs> significant in that it brings in, just over in 2014, $13.2 billion of export earnings. Okay, that's the largest export earner in New Zealand. And the estimates that it feeds about 100 million people. It is an important industry. It is an industry that has also made massive productivity gains in the last 25 years, so since 1990. Um, the amount of milk solids we produce, so that's the fat and protein part of our milk, and it's the part that largely our farmers get paid for. It makes up about 10% of the total a litre of milk is made up of um, fat and protein. That's trebled in the past 25 years. And that's on the back of large increases in the amount of milk solids that produced per cow and the amount of milk solids that's produced per hectare and it's on the back of an increase in the number of cows that we have per hectare on a national basis so going from just under 2.4 to 2.9 cows per hectare and it comes on the back of about a doubling of the size, a number of cows that we have in New Zealand going up to from 2.4 to 5 million cows okay these productivity gains are really impressive and they've come about through some really crucial things about the efficient use of pastures, the efficient use of supplements, a reduction in technical risk on our farms, a reduction in financial risk, really good research extension and dissemination of those messages to the farmers, and a really great ability of the New Zealand dairy industry to adopt new ideas and to get them out to their farmers and take on board those ideas. It's pretty impressive targets to change. However, it's come over a little bit of a cost. The size and scale of our current dairy industries, okay, and how many cows we have, what area they're actually on, leads to the current dairy industry having a relatively large environmental impact. And it's largely associated with concerns around greenhouse gases, around the amount of water we use in the dairy industry, and concerns around the quality of our water that comes out, like phosphorus lost to waterways, and in particular I'll talk about tonight, about nitrogen loss to the environment, to our waterways. That problem, the, the, the environmental problem is primarily associated with our outdoor grazing systems, the systems that we are famous for in, here in New Zealand. The old dairy cow, she pees about 12 times a day, and each of those uh, is about 2.5 litres each time she pees. And because she's grazing outside, there is no opportunity to capture that urine and spread it out thinly across the pasture. That urine patch that comes out, it comes out in an area of about two, of, of a quarter of a metre squared, 0.25 metres squared, and in really high concentrations of nitrogen, about anywhere in excess of 500 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, forming in a little patch. That creates the environmental problem. We get nitrous, ox oxide, nitrous oxide losses to the atmosphere, and we get nitrate leaching when the, basically the soil, the soil water drains through, takes the nitrogen with it, and is lost to our waterways, to our aquifers, and to our lowland rivers. I think it is pretty clear, though, that the government, society, and farmers all agree that the environmental footprint is too high and must be reduced. Yeah, they all agree with that. For example, here we are in environmental Canterbury, the region here and the National Policy Statement on Freshwater Management. Significant reductions are actually required by our farmers. We're sitting in the Selwyn Tiwai Horror Zone. By 2022, what we're looking at for this zone is that our dairy farms reduce their historical nitrogen loss, could be viewed as what it's sitting at at this point in time, by 30%. 
That's a large loss. Significant reductions are required. Really, this is the challenge that we see for the dairy industry, what we actually have to be thinking about in terms of productivity and environmental footprint. A lot of farmers now fit in that average box. Their productivity or profitability is relatively low relative to their total environmental footprint. The best farmers now are in a position where their environmental footprint is lower and they're making a bit more money and more productivity is higher. But where we really need to be in that future is that golden position for not only dairy but our livestock industries where our total productivity and, and profitability is higher and our environmental footprint is actually lower than where it sits at the moment. That's where we need to be in the future. What's the dairy industry doing about it? There's been some things that have happened and been really good. And we're not perfect around these things yet. But things around effluent management, I just threw up a, a document from Dairy NZ's effluent management uh, system there. Effluent management is much better than it was. The commitment to um, sustainable dairy and the water court. Under that regime now, we basically see that there's, on dairy farms, 25,000 kilometres of waterways are actually fenced off to exclude livestock. And of our dairy farms, 96% of them are actually measured as having their waterways actually fenced off. And that's a pretty significant achievement around the edges of our waterways. However, while we've made progress in those areas around effluent and around, particularly around our waterways and fencing them off, perhaps less progress has actually been made out in the paddock, which is where a lot of our environmental losses, particularly nitrogen, actually occur. And spend a little bit of time trying to give you a picture of why we have a problem. So we have a pastoral-based system. It's largely based on grasses and legumes, so the efficient system that we've developed. And generally in those systems, our plants need nitrogen to make them grow more. Essentially more nitrogen makes photosynthesis higher, and as a consequence, we get greater pastoral growth. And all of our pastures will run, I'll consistently have about 3 to 4% nitrogen actually in them. On the other hand, a dairy cow could be viewed as requiring about 2.8 to 3% nitrogen for her requirements for a lactating cow. The general outcome of what we actually find there is the difference between 3.3 to 4% going in to the cow, 2.8% requirement. A lot of, and a very small proportion of the, uh, the nitrogen actually goes, actually ends up in the milk. It's only about 20 to 35% ends up in the milk being transported off the farm. The rest ends up going out in urine or feces in high concentration. That creates our environmental problem. Okay? If you don't want an environmental problem, you probably either have no cows or you've got to find some way of capturing that urine that's avoiding it completely. Take them off the paddock, capture the urine, spread it thinly. Okay? So we have structures to be able to do that, but whether they are profitable, we'll talk a little bit about. So if we want to mitigate this, we've probably got to think back to the good old nitrogen cycle. So we have nitrogen coming in in terms of nitrogen inputs from fertilizer, nitrogen fixation from plants, and coming in in supplements and feed we bring in. That's eaten by the animal. Some of it goes into the maintenance of dairy cow and sort of retained for live weight gain. About 20 to 30% ends up going out in the milk off the farmer's product. And then the rest is actually lost as dung and urine. On the ground there, it can be recycled through the soil and taken up again. So fundamentally, if we want to think about mitigating some of these things and reducing the losses, we can probably think about these types of things. Can we find better cows in terms of how they process nitrogen, allocate it into the milk, and end up less going out in the urine? Can we find foragers? And foragers are a really good solution here because those are the things that drive the dairy industry. Can we find foragers that when they're consumed by the animal end up with more nitrogen and going into the milk, less into neurone, or perhaps altering the distribution of nitrogen in a paddock? Once that nitrogen comes out of the cow, can we find a way of sucking more nitrogen up out of the soil so it doesn't get lost and essentially keep it recycling around or at least move it to a, a lower risk period in the year? And finally, what can we do around a farm systems context to put all this together to develop a system that is actually profitable for farmers still? Because believe me, if we start introducing 
um, environmental uh, mitigation strategies that actually impinge on the profitability of the farmer, there will certainly be more hesitant to take them up. And we've got to try and find things that align with normal farming practices. Okay, so what we're going to move on to now is actually have a look at some of those and see where we're moving along the way in terms of how we actually mitigate some of those losses. And remember, we're going on a journey here, component research through farm systems down to full farm scale demonstration. First of all, do we have cows that allocate more nitrogen into milk? Well, the answer to that is we probably do already. And it's probably partly come about as a consequence of the breeding programs that we have engaged in over long periods of time. So most farmers are adopting some sort of uh, um, a breeding program using essentially artificial insemination and using improved genetics coming in there. So we have essentially cows that could be of high genetic merit and that may be associated with breeding worth, where cows are selected for things like milk production, longevity in the herd, and aspects related to that. If we take a simple comparison of those types of cows, so we feed cows, we control the inputs, how much we put in, we work out how much is going into milk, urine and different components, we find that essentially our cows that we're really trying to create through our breeding and are in our breeding and throwing currently are already, okay, they produce more milk cells per cow, which we hope, they're more feed conversion efficient, so of the feed that actually goes in, they produce more milk. But in terms of actually that component, which is actually how the nitrogen is allocated, there's an indication that more nitrogen goes into milk of what they consume, and also of the nitrogen that's left over, less actually ends up going out in urine. Okay? So we've probably got a little bit of embedded technology in our dairy industry already associated with animal breeding that is important from the point of view of nitrogen losses. What about foragers? Okay, and I'll spend quite a bit of time on foragers because I fundamentally believe that they are real, the real secret to managing our environmental problems in the dairy industry. Partly because they are the things that we're feeding to dairy cows and they are the things that if we can do something through a forage to actually manage and mitigate losses, it is a very powerful tool. New Zealand dairy industry for long periods of time has largely been based on um, this beast over here, a perennial ryegrass white clover mixture. Okay? So we have a grass, very tough, hard wearing, productive, tolerant of um, many pests and diseases and grows well. And we have the legume putting nitrogen into the system through fixation and we have a very high quality pasture. We have a range of other foragers out there that are available. There are things like, in this picture, oh, in this picture here, we have things like plantain, which is narrow leaf plantain. It's a herb species, has a little fibrous root on it. We have chicory. That's the thing that looks like lettuce in this picture here, this little one here. Okay. These are foragers that are available on the market now, and they're typically been available for things like they have improved summer growth and have high quality. Our interest in these initially started out to try and improve the dry matter intake of a dairy cow. But what we've learned is that some of these foragers actually have quite large effects on how nitrogen is petitioned in the cow with the outcome that we generally end up with the nitrogen concentration of the urine going down and the loading of nitrogen patches reducing. So I have an example here, the type of experiment we often do, we take a perennial ryegrass white clover pasture and then we compare that to a more diverse pasture containing, like this on the right hand side here, containing chicory, plantain. And when we do that, cows produce the same amount of milk, which is good, because it's not impinging on milk production, introducing something new. But we see that they allocate a bit more nitrogen into the, um, the milk component, which is important. But this is pretty important down here, that the urine end concentration, so that's the loading of the urine patch part of it, goes down by about 30% when you feed um, the diverse pasture. So that the total nitrogen that the cow is actually peeing out goes down as well. We can look at it from a specific point of view. Some excellent PhD students like uh, Lisa Box is working on this at the moment. So have cows that are seen here and we can offer them uh, perennial ryegrass over here, offer them some plantain on this side. We can do it as a 50-50 mixture or pure swords of this species. Again in this case, giving a really powerful impact of a particular plant species. 
So uh, we've got pasture as we fed by itself, ryegrass, white clover pasture, or in the situation where we've got pasture and plantain as a 50-50 mix, and then pure plantain by itself. Milk volume and milk solids actually going up as the pasture plantain is being fed. But actually in the opposite direction, the concentration of nitrogen in the urine is going down by actually halving when turning perennial ryegrass to plantain. Okay. Concentration is not the only thing, however, about when we're thinking about mitigating environmental losses. And yes, it is a rubber glove attached to the tail end of a cow. Okay. This concentration of nitrogen is not the only thing affecting how much nitrogen goes out in the urine patch. It is not the only thing that's important. What is also important is where that urine falls. How many times she pees per day? So is it 12, 20 times? Is it in big, large patches? And we're getting to the stage now where we can actually have a good understanding of those processes going on. So this is one that's a pretty rudimentary one that we use here at Lincoln. There's more sophisticated ones, but this is actually quite effective. So it's a, a rubber glove, okay, with attached to the tail of the cow effectively. Urine comes out into this. Uh, you note that uh, three of the fingers are shut off so that the urine actually flows out through one of the fingers. Flows out into a little um, U-band here which is basically a um, piece of PVC plate with essentially a flow meter in it. Okay? And with, through that we can work out things like how many times a cow pees a day, what is the volume of these urinations. And with that we can compare pasture mixtures of different types and we find that when we feed dairy cows a more diverse pasture we typically end up with the cow actually urinating more often. So we've got 15 versus 12 urinations a day and the urination volume going down a little bit. Okay? The outcome of that is that the actual urine patch loading that we're actually going in with here is actually quite a bit lower when we actually use a diverse and a ryegrass based pasture. So this is an example here. Ryegrass based pasture, perennial ryegrass, probably loading about 600 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare into the urine patch. A diverse pasture containing chicory and plantain in this case was loading only about 350. Okay, let me put that in context. That is like a dairy cow in one case and a diverse pasture is like a sheep urine patch. That's what we're talking about, the contrast here. We can look at how it could impact on how much nitrogen actually comes out of the dairy cow, uh, the, the soils however. So we've got this relationship. We know there's relationships between urine application rate, how much nitrogen goes onto the paddock, and the amount of nitrogen leached. And we find that as we come back down here, we probably get a reduction of somewhere about 60 to 70 kilograms of nitrogen actually is lost uh, from that urine patch. When you can think about that using, feeding the plantain based pasture. What is the potential for nitrogen loss at the farm scale of that? It's probably quite large, but you need to go through a few steps to actually get there. So we need to take some data on the ryegrass white clover and a more diverse pasture. We need to work out how these things grow from a seasonal production point of view. We get some data on that. We combine that with some data in terms of modelling with data which says what is the relationship between how much we offer an animal and how much she produces in terms of milk solids. We find that's quite similar in a ryegrass white clover and a diverse pasture. We combine that with the information that you generate around um, urine patch distribution and where it is in the paddock and how many times a cow urinates a day. We combine that then with the data around the relationship between nitrogen loading in the urine patch and how much um, nitrogen is actually leached. And you get this type of outcome at the farm system scale from modelling. Okay? So if you had 50% of your farm in this diverse pasture, you would get an 18% reduction in the amount of nitrogen you lost with the same amount of milk production. Okay? It's pretty powerful, potentially, some of the stuff. What about some of the other things we can do with foragers? How about we want to suck up more nitrogen out of the soil? So the cow pees out 500 to 700 kilograms of nitrogen in autumn, and then it's raining, we get drainage and it soaks through. We want to soak it up quickly. And the things you start thinking about from a forage point of view are things like, can we have plants that have different root systems or grow at different speeds in the cool season period? So we might think we've got perennial ryegrass white clover. They actually have a really shallow root system. 
in them. They might not be sucking up much nitrogen. We've got diverse pastures containing chicory and plantain with deeper rooting systems, tap roots, plantain with a really fibrous root system. And we have tall fescue, which is a grass plant with a deeper rooting system. And then we might have something like Italian ryegrass, which has a really fibrous root system, but also has a really good cool season activity. It grows better in the cool season. If we look at the importance of that cool season activity, some of the work I've done uh, with Jim Moyer, we point that actually the ability to grow during the cool season is vitally important for reducing nitrate leaching. That's in most places in New Zealand when greatest losses are occurring simply because that is when your drainage is occurring from the soil profile, taking the nitrogen with it. Got this example here, just a pot trial in this case, but it shows some really important points. Put nitrogen on pots with different plant species on them, that's represented by the dots up there. Put either no nitrogen on, put 300 kilograms of nitrogen, which is like a sheep urine patch, or 700 like a dairy cow urine patch. You confirm some things here. If you didn't have dairy cows, which is like that zero nitrogen kilograms per hectare, you would have lower nitrogen losses. We know that. Okay? If you had sheep, they would actually have lower nitrogen losses than a dairy cow. But also, you've got this relationship. The more nitrogen you can suck up out of the soil in the cool season period through greater plant uptake, going up to the forage, the less nitrogen that's leached. Essentially you're moving it to a period in the year where it's at lower risk. If we look at that in a real context when we start measuring some of these things, I'm very grateful to Keith Cameron and be involved in his research programs around this, where we actually try and measure nitrate leaching losses through a range of methods like lysimeters. These are barrels that are uh, essentially uh, dug down into the ground and some of them are very stony and some of better soils on occasions taken away, taken back to a sort of a field laboratory like this here, and we were able to measure the amount of nitrogen actually coming out the bottom of the soil profile. We plant different plant species in them, we put nitrogen on the top, perhaps in different concentrations or coming from different animal species. We can work out a lot of things about treatment effects and how important it is for nitrate leaching. And we find in this context that in the South Canterbury context, one of the most important plant species is actually Italian ryegrass. So this is a ryegrass, okay, widely available, it's on the market, has a, uh, not, doesn't often, doesn't last quite as long as perennial ryegrass, but it actually has substantially less nitrate leaching. It's primarily because it is associated with greater cool season activity. Okay, some of the other plant species you think about, like tall fescue, which might have a really uh, deep rooting system, may be less effective, primarily because they don't have great cool season activity and don't grow as much. But things like Italian ryegrass are really powerful tools. And this whole thing around nitrogen uptake is very important where we come to some of our farming systems that are the real hotspots for nitrogen losses, like our winter forage crops out there on dairy farms. We have cows grazing fodder beet, we have cows grazing kale, high yielding crops, utilised to a high degree, therefore requiring really high, very high stocking densities, thousands of cows per hectare to actually achieve the utilisation of the forage. These cows are actually um, urinating on paddocks where basically you might have a situation where about 70 to 80 percent of the ground area is actually covered by urination during the winter period. Curse falls on the ground, there's nothing there to soak it up, there's a lot of rainfall often during winter and therefore we get high nitrogen losses. That's occurring, okay? What is the basis of using things like catch crops? Okay, pretty simple technology, but actually a really powerful one in this context of take, taking up nitrogen. So a catch crop is something that instead of leaving that land fallow for a period of time, once the dairy cows have grazed it off, you put in a crop like, in this case, oats, so afterwards, that can grow through, you might take it as a silage crop, and then it can rotate back around into your, your forage crop again, and you'll loop it back around on a cycle like that. Is it a powerful technology? Yes, it is. Okay. Compared to kale in this case, when we grow um, kale and we grow it at a, um, and we have a fallow afterwards of uh, th two months before we put it back into a crop, basically, if we want to put in a catch crop of oats almost immediately afterwards that, we can get levels of nitrate reduction around about a 40% decrease. If we manage to get in there with 21 days, even if you get it in two months later, 63 days, you get a 28% decrease in nitrate leaching. A really powerful tool to actually have in this context. Okay, I'm just going to get a drink.
Okay, so what about the farm systems? So how do we bring all this together to drive and improve farm systems when we've got to really think about dollars, profit, and environmental performance as well? I've been fortunate to be involved in a, a, a really neat pay, uh, project in Canterbury, which is called the Pastoral 21 Phase 2 Program. This started about six years ago, and at this point in time, we were grappling with the issue of how to develop farm systems for dairy, next generation systems, that were profitable with lower environmental impact. And at that time, we could see that the dairy industry could basically take two directions. Essentially, it could go to a more cows, more milk approach, producing more milk per hectare and generating higher profit through that method. And you might have to use infrastructure to be able to, uh, to, be able to control the environmental footprint. Alternatively, you could have a fewer cows approach. Fewer cows, higher milk solids per, cow, uh, per individual cow, and greater efficiency. Okay? Might be viewed as going back to 25 years ago, but not quite, because the cows we use today are very different from the cows that we used 25, 40 years ago, and the foragers that we use today are also very different from that point of view today. So we might be going back to a stocking rate we used 25, 30 years ago, but not the system. So the objective around this was to redesign the milking platform part and the winter forage crop part to improve the overall property of businesses and actually reduce environmental impact. So we're looking at the milking platform where cows are during the lactation period, so from um, July through to May, and the wintering part where they're in the July-August period. And the way we did this was we took a very successful farm the Link University Demonstration Farm, and said, in that time, 2011 to 2014, it was operating at 3.9 cows per hectare. It was, had a 313 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare applied to it, relatively in high nitrogen fertilizer use, and had a kale grass wintering system. And went in two directions. One direction, high stocking rate, more of, and five cows a hectare, put in more feed into it. We put in nearly a thousand kilograms of feed, extra feed going into it as a supplement. And we put on a relatively high nitrogen fertilizer rate, just over 300. We also went in the other direction, three and a half cows a hectare, didn't put much nitrogen fertilizer on, only 150 in this case, and we're trying to get reasonably high live weight per hectare. In terms of breeding worth, uh, we had a high breeding with cow, we had diverse pastures in it, and we had to catch crops. All the things that I talked about on that component research turned up in here as a farm systems. In these pastures, we also had nitrification inhibitors. Okay? We started out with those, those were things like, that was EcoN. That is a product that we cannot use anymore since it's been taken off the market as a tool to mitigate nitrogen losses. Okay? That's why it's in the brackets. What do we find in terms of milk production? Okay because we need to think about milk production as a driver, in many cases, of our profitability. LUDF down the middle. Now, LUDF down the Link University Demonstration Farm down the middle is actually a very high producing dairy farm, always in the top 2 to 3% nationally of production. Okay, so we've got some pretty high standards and metrics that we're actually comparing it to here. When we went to a high input system, we produced 2,355 kilograms of milk solids per hectare coming from 467 kgs of milk solids per cow. Low stock rate system over here, high efficient, we got up to 1,782 kilograms of milk solids per hectare. That's very high milk production at that stocking rate and coming from over 510 kgs of milk solids per cow. So for those in the audience, there was a figure in here, okay, each cow was producing over 100% of its body weight in terms of milk solid production, which is pretty high level of milk production. What about the nitrogen losses? Because we're thinking about milk, we've got to think about nitrogen. Again, the stocking rates. We've got this line here, which is the nitrogen surplus. Nitrogen surplus refers to the difference between nitrogen coming into your farm and feed, uh, nitrogen fertilizer, fertil um, nitrogen fixation, and, nit and basically the nitrogen goes out in product. Milk, live weight, essentially going out in farm. And we find that as we increased basically stocking rate and level of feed input, your nitrogen surplus goes up. Nitrogen leach from the milking platform, in this case, calculated by um, our overseer, a nutrient budgeting model, but also confirmed by some um, measurements of nitrate leaching actually done on these systems. 
lowest in the low input system. Okay? High inputs have greater losses. Nitrate leaching from the winter crop, we just summed it as 64 across the whole lot in this case. And if we look at the average for the milking platform, we find that we get the lowest uh, nitrogen losses in the low input, high efficiency system. Okay? And the really one at the bottom there, nitrogen conversion efficiency. Of the nitrogen you're using on your dairy farm, how much actually ends up going into milk is higher in the low input system. Need some dollars and cents on this. What does it mean? Okay? Because I go back to the point at the beginning. If you want to develop a system for mitigation of nitrogen losses, you do really want something that in the first instance retains a level of profitability that you had previously, but really what you're searching for is something that is more profitable than you previously had. In terms of the system, uh, we look at a range of milk solid prices going from what we wish for at $6.30 to what we actually probably have got at the moment, somewhere around $4.40, modelled in this case. And we look at the, in terms of the, at the higher milk solid payout, okay, very similar between the high input and the low input system. But as we come down through those milk solid payout the prices, gaining greater profitability at the low input system. A couple other metrics here that you throw float around in your head. This is the amount of essentially the dollars per kilogram of nitrogen leached. Again, in all metrics on this, a low stocking rate efficient system giving greater efficiency in terms of how much money you produce, do, um, produce uh, per kilogram of nitrogen leached from your system. Okay, so that's a bit about farm systems. And I want to take you a bit of a journey about how we got this into a, a real farm. Okay, Linky versus demonstration farm. Any of you on Facebook and things like that? This farm, in the past week, Ron, month, week, has had 5,700 hits on Facebook related to it. Okay? It is an immensely successful demonstration vehicle. Since its establishment in 2001, it has had 40,000 visitors to it. It is immensely successful. This farm in 2000 um, 14, 2013, being a part of the Selwyn T.Y. Hora and uh, um, sort of catchment, was looking for its solution to be able to say, how do we reduce our nitrogen losses by about 30% while still remaining profitability? And it really showed leadership in taking what we have actually done from, say, our Pastoral 21 work and take it through into a full farms demonstration. At that point in time, it basically had two options as to how it could address its environmental footprint and still remain profitable. One was this, which was to invest in infrastructure. So that could be infrastructure. It could range from some reasonably a couple of standoff facilities. So we've got this one on the left, which is actually wood chip. Uh, dairy cows on wood chip, basically a standoff. This one over here, something more sophisticated, this is actually dairy cows are on carpet, something we're looking at at the moment, it's like a synthetic carpet. Nice and white, they haven't been on there too long, so there's not much dung on it. Okay, so it was one way you could go. Okay, obviously that has a cost associated with it. Okay, over $500 per cow at least to be able to get one of these systems in operating. Or you could have a nil infrastructure type structure, uh, system lower inputs of nitrogen and imported feed. And what Lincoln University Demonstration Farm did was actually based on the results of the Pasture 21 Phase 2 work which I just described, say, actually, well, we believe in the research. We believe in the farm systems research. And we think this is a pathway we could actually take to actually demonstrate profitability and environmental impact. So what they did was they took 2012, which was operating at 3.9 cows a hectare, 350 kilograms of nitrogen fertiliser, high levels, and 430 kgs of imported supplement. They went through a transition year where they actually reduced the number of cows in preparation for this. And then in 2014 to 2016, they said, well, okay, three and a half cows a hectare, 143 kilograms of nitrogen, and a very small amount of board and feed, like we've been done in the past 21 work. And we look at some of the big things that are coming out of this. Okay? The first thing you've got to think about is what is the total land area that is actually used for these production systems when you change it. So what we've done this is here, here we've actually normalised the initial data to 100% of what we used basically for the first 
uh, 10 years of the farm, up to 2010, 2011. This was 2012, and then we've got the land area in here, and this is the land area over here for the farm, which is in 2014 to 2016. And what we said is, what is the required land area for these farms when you actually take account of the feed you need for the milking platform, so that's where the cows are milked, how much feed we need to, land we need to make the supplementary feed to feed these cows and bring into the farm, how much area we need to feed the replacements, so these are the one and two year olds that are running around out in the industry, producing environmental footprint but not actually producing any uh, milk product until they come back into the industry, and how much is needed for wintering. And you see some of these metrics when you went to the new system, low stock and more efficient, the total amount of land area that was using was about 90% of what it was from a historical ash, ash, um, time period. That was largely associated with no change on the milking platform because that was the same, just had fewer cows on it. But there's an important point that if you actually drop your stocking rate, you need la less land area to be committed to the dairy farm to support the wintering and to support the replacements in, this, uh, in particular, essentially because you have fewer cows and fewer requirements there. What about your nitrogen losses? Okay, and this is interesting stuff to take count of. Again, the historical average, 2010 to 2011, set at 100%. 2012, 2013, that big high nitrogen fertilizer level and a high level of um, basically feed brought in for uh, the replacement stock, land area actually went up. Required, the total nitrogen losses actually went up. Through to 2014, 16 in this time period, we see that the total amount of nitrogen loss Basically, for your total farm, everything factored in is about 80% of what it was in 2010 and 11. It comes about partly because on the milking platform you have fewer cows, but that effect is actually relatively small because as each injured cow eats a lot more, she actually pees out more nitrogen as well. So that's a bit small. The big impact that actually happens in terms of reducing nitrogen losses is simply because you have less of a footprint associated with wintering of dairy cows and less of a footprint associated with wintering your replacements. You have few of them. And those are the ones that are out there for two years before they actually produce any product. So nitrogen losses, about 80% of what they were in terms of historical averages. Okay. How do we do on that other metric though of how much money we're actually making and how much milk we're actually being produced? So this is the stocking rate um, going from 2012, 3.9 to 3.5 in 2014 and 2015-16. And one thing about this is that in terms of uh, research farms, it's often thought that the productivity of milk production of research farms is often far in excess of what is, uh, which can be achieved in a commercially run farm. I think the Lincolnish Demonstration Farm has demonstrated that is actually not the case, and they actually have higher levels of milk production than we were actually able to achieve in research. And we get numbers out at a 525 kgs of milk solids per cow. Again, that's pretty phenomenal, producing 1,812 kgs of milk solids. We factor it all together in terms of how much money you make in dairy operating profit. So between 2012, through 2013 and 14 in the interim year to the two last years when running a lower stock rate efficient system. And you see that farm working expenses go down somewhat, primarily because you have fewer cows there. Profit on a really good year when modelled at $4.60 kgs of milk solids, $14.88 down here at historical average. And again, we've got back to that with a lower stocking rate system and high efficient. Same level of profitability. So if you look at that, you got the same profit as what you had previously, but you got a 20% less total loss of nitrogen to your catchment in 2015 than we did have in 2012-13. Really important point that I'll kind of come back and emphasize in, this, in a minute. Okay, so I've taken down a journey a little bit today of looking at component research, farmlet research and demonstration. I'm just going to make a little plug here for what Link University, and I've been very fortunate to be part of this, has actually been outstanding in actually promoting this pathway. So we've been able to do component research on soils, forage and individual animals associated with Link University Research Dairy Farm, in particular just across the road here. We've been able to have farmlet research associated with the farm systems like the Pasture 21 work 
that we've done at Link University Research Dairy Farm and about to do at the Ashley Dean Research and Development Station. And then we've had this demonstration aspect. Okay? Immensely successful pathway of taking component research through farm system research and testing it and bringing it on to um, real farm situations. And that is actually an important path for taking through, providing solutions for farmers that are actually real and actually very tangible. In this context here, I just mentioned this middle one here, just before I wrap up, the Ashley Dean Research and Development Station. Okay, we are now milking cows on a new research and development station, milking cows this week. Uh, Link University has made a significant investment in this facility and has shown great foresight in actually doing this and in taking a, a leadership position, again in this area of profitable farming systems that have low environmental impact. I made this point, just as astronomers, you need a telescope to actually do work. Those involved in land, water, and environmental research actually need facilities at a reasonably large, uh, large scale. Our laboratory is actually things like cows, grass, partly milking sheds and dairy sheds, but actually facilities to be able to quantify and document and to provide real solutions for the industry. So thank you very much, Link University, for supporting that program. So I'm going to wrap up here and give you some conclusions. The current dairy farming systems in New Zealand, which are outdoor based on pastoral systems, have an environmental footprint that we all agree needs to be reduced. It is a larger consequence of the way that we farm and the inefficiencies in the dairy production system. I would argue that a lot of progress has actually been made in reducing the environmental footprint through the use of low input, high efficiency strategies and the use of improved forages will become a very important part of that. There is still a great amount of progress that needs to be made to reach what I call the golden position of where we're actually looking at is greater profitability and profit with a low environmental footprint. That's really where we want to be in the future. We're not there yet, but that is where the dairy industry and other livestock industries must actually aspire to be. Now wrapping up, I'd just like to thank a range of programs that have helped us here the Dairy System Environmental Protection, Pasture 1 and Phase 2, Forage to Reduce Nitrate Leaching and the Greener Pastures Program and a group of funders that have been very important for looking at this work through time. So thank you very much and welcome your question. This is kind of like a, a, an odd question about where they pee in the paddock. Um, Cows come into a, a shed through a gate. Yeah. They they come they, they exit out. Have have you been able to say or see where there's a greater concentration? Like is it let's get off the empty <laughs> shed and let it go, or um, is it centered around those access points? And and do you think if you put your carpet out there <laughs> that you could alter um, those patterns of where preferences of might be, or is it just totally random? Okay, and, and, and random thoughts are very good. Um, so we, there has been a lot of work done around the distribution of cow urination patterns, whether it's on raceways, milking sheds, access points into the paddock, and there's a lot around the access points. But in often our pastoral systems, because it's reasonably intense grazing pressure, we get urination pretty much across the entire uh, the paddock, okay? I think you can think about your concept of the carpet, however, so we can think more about those wintering systems where the, the cows are actually very concentrated in small spaces of time, or, or small areas. That is potentially an area where a mobile carpet that you can move around with some sort of very simple collection system or effluent may have be a very powerful tool for actually mitigating environmental impacts. Yeah. But excellent question. You've shown that a lower input system can match the profitability to the higher stocking rates. Yeah. Is there further to go there? Can you go lower, less inputs to get to your 30% nitrogen reduction from where you were? Is it is it sort of the, is there another step, even less <laughs> stocking to get more efficient and therefore lower lower inputs, lower outputs? Um, there's always a balance there of, of how far you go down that continuum to a. a to a lower stocking rate, okay? 
And, and as you go further down, what tends to happen is that there is concern around essentially how much pasture you utilise and how effective that utilisation of the pasture actually is, with implications for perhaps pasture quality. In terms of what we've done on the Lincoln University demonstration farm and the low stock rent system, there is probably room to move somewhat further down. And associated with that is this key thing that is probably going on and why you can actually say this is that as part of an improvement in the genetic merit of your herd, part of that is on an annual basis, the actual cow requirements are actually going up at the same time. So there is a potential to go somewhat further. But I don't think that you can go substantially further in that uh, particular movement. Yeah. yeah, I guess just an observation. Yeah. Um, you didn't answer the question you asked in the very beginning. So is the dairy industry friend or foe? But I guess yeah. what would interest me probably still more is, uh, I, I guess what we have seen is uh, uh, some proposals how to change some parameters of this industrial <coughs> process, and I learned that it has nothing to do with farming, it's just industry. Hmm. Uh, is there anybody taking a little bit more holistic view? So maybe looking how much dairy is good or tolerable for uh, something like the Canterbury plan and maybe looking as well uh, would it make sense to mix dairy and other forms of agriculture and would this maybe improve the situation? Look, this, this is very much the, the concept around catchment scale management that is actually occurring so as part of the land and water regional plan such as in Sal and Tiwara we zone which actually looks at the makeup of those catchments in terms of what they are currently and what sort of losses uh, each picture part of those farming systems and they should actually have. The issue that you're grappling with is around, okay, should we be changing from one system to the other and look at mixed farming systems? Well, Canterbury is like that already. It's a mixture of farming systems already. And so we have arable, we have sheep and beef, we have dairy. And at this point in time, there is immensely strong linkages between those industries already. So we have the arable industry actually contributing sometimes a feed into the, the, the dairy industry, providing a site for the wintering of dairy cows. We have a sheep production industry and a beef industry, uh, to the beef industry. They might be taking replacements um, the, and um, calves out of the dairy industry. They might be wintering replacements or, or uh, rearing replacements for the dairy industry. Those ind industries are always already hugely integrated together. Okay? I think there is a future pathway that we could actually be taking and thinking about, which we haven't quite got to, is how we manage things at the total catchment level. And that there's work to be done in that area. In answering your question, of, is it a friend or a foe? I think it's a friend. I put up the beginning to say that this number is 13.2 billions of export earning, 50,000 people employed in our industry, powerful, um, powerful um, engagement with social communities. Still a friend. If you consider any environmental impact as being unacceptable, it is a foe. If you are prepared to accept that as a consequence of our production systems there is some environmental impact but it's at an unacceptable level currently and we actually have to reduce it, is the position I would actually take and that's the position I actually promoted here. Yeah. Hello, uh, Grant, two questions. David. Yeah. Uh, firstly, um, how much does the improvement in the genetic yeah of the cows influence your longitudinal benefits, if you see what I mean. You're comparing 2012 with 2016 and you put up numbers saying that the cows were improving all this time. And, but, but more importantly, I sort of know, although it's not my subject, that these more complex pasture systems are quite a lot more difficult to manage and maintain. And I would have thought intuitively that having the benefit of being able to turn the tap on and off for water, to be able to turn the tap on and off for nitrogen, to have high enough stocking rates that you can carefully manage 
freight, feeding, and those sorts of things are highly important factors of that pastoral management over the more simple, perhaps more robust ryegrass and clover. Okay, so in answer to your first question around uh, progress, I don't, okay, there is obviously genetic progress between 2012 and, and improvement in breeding worth up to 2014. On that scale there, that probably has relatively small impact on the results. Other than for me to tell you that what is important around that reduction in stocking rate is that you do actually need to have a cow, a, 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 probably a cow of a high genetic merit is important to be able to consume enough herbage and to produce it into milk. Okay? That was my point, that if you've got to go back to a stocking rate that we were probably operating 30 or 40 years ago and then you didn't use genetics of 30 to 40 years ago, you would probably get a very different result in this case. Okay? So where your progress has been made. Some of these forages, yes, that um, the persistence of the forages in the mixture may be uh, less long term than that is what is associated with a ryegrass white clover pasture. Okay? It's not to say that a ryegrass white clover pasture doesn't have a pasture persistence problem because in many parts of New Zealand they actually still do in terms of that. So it's not, not exclusive to past, uh, forage persistence problem. I think you've got to look at identifying ways and, and be able to find a, a mode of delivery of some of the benefits of those forages. And that might be, instead of using mixtures, it might be pure sports. It might be Derek Moot's lucerne type product, okay, as a pure forage. It might be a pure forage of plantain, as to something else, as opposed to a mixture which is harder to manage, okay? In terms of those inputs that you have out there, irrigation management, stock management, will be critically important for not only increasing productivity but managing environmental footprint. What we're looking for here is, is some of those they might make a, a, they'll make an incremental change. What we're really looking for something is make substantial change. If we're looking for things that are in the ballpark of a 30% reduction, they've got to be quite significant. Hmm? So Grant, yeah. um, the Lincoln University change, yeah. you indicated they reduced their nitrogen. Yeah. Have they moved to diverse pastures from the ryegrass? White they have plate? They have some uh, diverse pastures, about, I think we're on 20? 40%. 40%. Okay. But, but they don't cover the numbers that are up there. Yeah, there. And that's an important point. They did not actually calculate it into those numbers. Lincoln University Dairy Farm are an early adopter of technology and actually believed in it and actually probably believed in the results that we produced and therefore actually have them embedded in the system already. Uh, Grant. Um, Grant over here. Grant. Yeah. Sorry, Grant. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we say yes, we all want to reduce yeah. the environmental footprint of dairy farming, but yet you still see unacceptable practices. And I mentioned to you the other day an email that the other day I saw a farmer driving his herd using a, a, route, a, a road route to get from one farm to the other, using yeah. the road river as an underpass. So my question to you, and I'm sure this is not the only instance of this sort of um, unacceptable sort of behaviour, what I want to know is um, what is the industry doing about um, bringing these, these sorts of behaviours into line? Okay. I think there's um, two approaches to that. And, um, um, one is sort of the, the stick and regulation approach. Um, which has been examples around, okay, so cows and waterways and actually cases taken against that. So that's one approach to it. I would actually look at and, and look at the other approach, which is essentially the carrot approach, to try to work with farmers to show them what is actually the benefit of adopting policies that are very much good environmental management processes. So that is fencing off waterways, not having your stock in there, doing things that are actually good for the environment and then being able to identify the link between that and how you market your product internationally and therefore being able to say, okay, well if you're performing in that particular way which is good for the environment, you should be actually getting a premium for your product. And some of the milk companies are worked in towards that. And I think that is a more effective strategy from my point of view than dealing with those actually um, uh, those occasions where you actually have people that are actually essentially doing things that are against regulations. Okay? But you may actually still have to take more prosecutions in that case. The simple case, don't pick up their milk. Um, 
please, what would be the effect on humans of nitrogen going into milk, not waste? Nitrogen going into milk, not waste. Um, well, the nitrogen is the, essentially the protein component of milk. Um, the, the, the increase in the amount of nitrogen that goes into milk uh, at the levels for a New Zealand dairy farm would actually make a relatively small impact on human health. And two, it would be positive. It would be positive. Was it, if it was larger, it would still be within the realms of being positive for health. Okay? So what we're actually talking about here, and we actually think about this, I mean, think of our dairy cows in an American total mixed ration system. In those systems, about, might be get about 35% of the nitrogen or protein they consume ends up going into the milk. We only get about um, somewhere between 25 and 30% because we have overall lower efficiency of, of how that happens. Okay? So it's not a major impact. Thank you. Okay. Yep. Great, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, tonight you've scattered one aspect of the dairy industry as a foe yeah. by not mentioning at all animal welfare and okay. health. Yep. And the modern high producing dairy cow has health problems that the older cow never had, metabolic disease, mastitis, lameness, and there are welfare issues such as uh, dehorning and bobby calves. So I just wondered if you'd like to make a brief comment on that, that you've skirted so far. Um, look, I, I did, did focus on the, the environmental aspect. Um, I think those welfare aspects are critically important uh, for essentially how we promote and sell our product. And we actually must be um, essentially extremely vigilant of actually attention to detail around those. I like some of the approaches that have gone on in the dairy industry, uh, in particular around how we wrap up welfare essentially with health and things like body condition score or body reserves in the animal. And identifying that, okay, we have, we have some cases of like a, um, how we score them for the, essentially the fatness. We have conditions which are essentially welfare cases, but we've actually identified what is the importance of reaching particular body condition score targets for production and um, uh, fertility reasons. And that is a really important pathway to go through this. And what we need to document here is actually what is actually the value of engaging in activities that are good for welfare and good for health and what are the benefits. And if I think about this, and I'll bring it back to the environment, one of the major environmental problems that we have is the underlying low fertility of the New Zealand dairy herd. So as the fertility actually is declining, which it actually has, what is actually happening, it means that essentially we actually have to have, uh, carry more replacement stock because we actually have to cull animals because they don't, don't not, not in calf again. And as a result of that, we get a greater environmental problem than we actually would. If we could find some way of improving the overall fertility of New Zealand dairy herd, it would have a significant contribution to reducing the environmental impact as well. So really important aspects to have. That's the only one you missed is Bobby Cat. Oh. <laughs> Just because it's my job to keep you on. Oh, okay, yeah, cool. <laughs> Look, we've, we've got to get it right. Uh, and in reality, we've got to find uh, an effective pathway for uh, use of those progeny in an effective manner in the other industries that we're related to as well, okay? But we've got to accept, and those are things that we must be on top of. Um, <coughs> I have to try and get this right. Um, seems to me you've forgotten a huge question, which is the question of climate change. Yeah. And that a huge percentage of New Zealand's carbon emissions come from agriculture. Um, is the research being, I mean, unless the climate change issues are addressed, none of this stuff will be very relevant because you'll be, you know, catching up on all sorts of problems with climate change. So what sort of research is being done to try and reduce emissions from agriculture? Yeah. Oh, so the question is largely around uh, climate change emissions. There's, there's a large project and the programs of work actually being done, particularly around nitrous oxide and methane emissions. Okay and pro large programs of works around carbon as well. And look at, give an example of some of the, the linkages here to what I talked about tonight. Okay, those things that actually reduce the nitrogen loading of the urine patch, such as forages, lower stocking rates, 
are equally as important for reducing nitrate leaching and they're equally as important for reducing nitrous oxide emissions as well because the two tie together pretty well. So these programs of work are tightly aligned and there's all, every attention is actually made to what extent you might be swapping one aspect of pollution for another aspect and there's large programs of work around that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, just as a retired production animal vet yeah. and also a previous um, stud cattle breeder, I think I'll first of all just answer your question as to what's the problem with dairy cattle fertility, why there's a problem. If they actually improve their body condition score, particularly going into mating so that they were actually on an increasing body condition score at that time there wouldn't be a problem and I proved that with my own herd not using drugs just management practice good management practice using a purely AI system and I brought the mean calving date forward and I condensed my calving and it was all to do with body condition score and a rising plane of nutrition. Okay. Thank at time of mating, but that's not the question I've been having yeah. my eye well, on the air for some time. But it does emphasise the point I made to Graham, which was that in terms of a welfare, identifying things like body condition score, which certainly have a link to some aspect of production or fertility, is actually a very powerful way of getting good welfare on our dairy farms. Now, my, my question that I've had my hand yeah. up for, for some time um, is related to welfare. I would like to for you to explain why it's been necessary with the conversion to intensive deer deering and pivot irrigation, why has it been necessary to take out the vast majority of windbreaks in Canterbury? Now I've got two concerns around this. Okay, first of all, pro the provision of shelter and shade is one of the five tenets of animal welfare. It's in the Code of Welfare for Dairy Cows and it's written up on the Fonterra website, the Dairy NZ website, and yet nobody's paying any attention <coughs> to it at all. So Dairy... can I just let Grant answer the question, please? No, no, well, I need to give him the background as well, to my I two have, concerns. I think I've got, think I've got the background. And then, yeah. then he can answer the question, OK? And dairy cows would have to be one of the most vulnerable classes of stock on the Canterbury Plains. They've got one of the thinner hair coats. They have virtually no subcutaneous fat, which gives the livestock insulation. And on the whole, they're in flat farming systems that offer no sort of topographical protection to them. And we've just been through a weekend where thousands of dairy cows across the plains were just standing in mud being subject to snowstorms and wind. Okay, I've got a question. Okay. No, but there's another part to it. Can I please be here? I'll, I'll answer the first part. Okay. okay. Look, I, look, I think there is, um, there is, okay, you could identify health and welfare benefits for, of um, shelter, shade. Um, I think clearly some of those are. Um, shade, uh, those uh, essentially hedgerows were removed and development of irrigation system. I'd appoint you now to some of the systems being developed and we take a look at Lincoln University demonstration farm with the advent of greater native tree planting for shelter and shade point of view and for environmental benefits. I'd also appoint you just to, just as you leave to go out and have a look and just the foyer out here, some of the excellent work that has been done on some of the farms, such as Naitahu's farms in Canterbury, around planting and around and tree planting and things like that. I think there's a recognition that, okay, we may have taken a little bit too far in terms of how many trees we took out, but we actually actually have to have some progression towards that. On the point of whether cows suffer heat stress and things like that, no. For Canterbury, you could argue in terms of heat stress, okay, that's high temperature. There's relatively little evidence of that. For Canterbury. Well, I have actually reviewed papers that show there are production problems okay. at both ends of, of the temperature spectrum. Okay, so okay. can I just uh, uh, the other uh, other concern, one other aspect of of the removal of all of the trees? It's been shown here at Lincoln with research projects that there's a definite increase in evapotranspiration from pastures when the trees are removed. 
There's also an increase in evaporation from pivot irrigators while they're in use. And this actually goes against the national policy statement fresh water that says efficiency of water use must be maintained or improved. Is there a question? Yeah. Well, that's just another part of what's the rationale for taking out all these trees when you could have easily left lots of these windbreaks in place between pivot irrigators. No, but I'm asking, can he explain why it's been necessary? So there are a number of reasons for that. We've perhaps had some people at well. So if there's a question here, please. Can you just wait for the microphone so we can catch it? Oh. So from Bernice, he studied in the same class from, with me in 1987. <laughs> <laughs> it's not an animal question, Grant. Back to your foragers. Do you think there's enough reward within the nutrient budget calculations to incentivise farmers to move in the more diverse pasture systems? Okay, so a lot of, in terms of that, most nutrient budget calculations in terms of compliance and regulation are done through nutrient um, management tools like Overseer. Mm -hmm. And currently some of the um, mitigation op options that I've talked about don't fully register with an Overseer currently. As part of the research program and how we work, we work in conjunction with um, the Overseer team and that nutrient management to progress putting those into those nutrient tools going forward. And that's an important step we have to go through. Having said that, okay, just like Lincoln University Demonstration Farm, you can see that if I was thinking here and as part of an environment, environmental plan and I was doing something good for the environment, some of these things you can clearly identify are actually good for the environment now, such as catch crops, using them afterwards, perhaps around forages, some of these things around lower stocking rate efficient systems. So there's every reason that if you're a a good steward of the land, you would be thinking about implementing those strategies now because that puts you in the progression in the right direction for reducing nitrogen losses. But there's work to be done certainly in getting uh, recognition of mitigation tools through robust science, getting robust science, good quantification of that data and actually getting them into the regulatory tools that we actually use. Um, recently the Fair Farmers have um, talked about genetic modification in New Zealand and I was just wondering what your opinion is, is there a place for that in New Zealand with creating plants that can take up more nitrogen and in the animal side of it as well or is there no place in New Zealand daring for that? Answer in two ways, like the, the potential value that they could add from that point of view is relatively large, for example of implementation of getting secondary plant compounds into plants that could actually create forages to reduce nitrogen losses, prove water use efficiency, those sort of things are important. Equally, there are probably approaches with animals that could be useful as well. Look, I think if you look at this point in time, because of the way that we actually market our particular project, projects on a, a clean green image, essentially, and the value of that, that actually drives essentially the, the, the amount of product that we can sell and the markets that we can have access to, at this point in time, although it's a, it is a useful technology that we should be perhaps progressing with from a research point of view, but I can't see in the foreseeable future that it will actually be used. It needs more debate, however. Hi, um, I had quite a lot of questions, but I'll stick with just one. Yeah. yeah. Um, how much profit is enough? <laughs> <laughs> It's a, it's a really good question, okay? And at the moment, probably most dairy farmers would actually say that they're not actually making enough profit, okay? <laughs> it's profit that you can actually sustain your business and actually stay there without, essentially without the banks coming in and taking you over. That's where we're sitting at the moment, okay? That's the profit you should be looking at. In terms of what the profit we're actually looking at in terms of how we manage that related to environmental impact, we should be suggesting that the profit that we are actually getting uh, with new mitigation tools should be at least as what it was previously, if not higher than what it was previously. Yeah. Hard question to answer. Uh, considering the 
the environmental footprint and um, maintain the profit for the farmer. Grant, where do you see the future of uh, New Zealand farming system? New Ze dairy or? Dairy, look, yes. Dairy, look, I, 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 do, I do see that the dairy industry will probably diverge in two directions. One is the low stocking rate, if more efficient system used to improve forages, driving profitability and env improved environmental footprint, greater welfare through that. There'll be a portion of industry in that pathway. There will also be a proportion of industry that will take the greater infrastructure, essentially, whether it's concrete, carpets, those types of things, roofs over top, and greater feed inputs and mitigate nitrogen losses through that pathway. Look at, and there'll be probably somewhere in between, but it won't be just one of those systems. And you look at farmers in New Zealand will find our ways of making those profitable and actually be achieving high levels of profitability in each of those systems with good, uh, with lower environmental impact. So it'll be a divergence of those systems probably. Hi. Uh, do, do you see a scope of using uh, trees and shrubs as fodder for reducing the environmental impact? Okay, excellent question because uh, trees and shrubs, things like willows, contain a range of uh, secondary plant compounds, which are well known to have uh, reduced environmental impact. And we've done experimentation, for example, we take the byproducts of making red wine and feed it to dairy cows, like the grape products, and it does reduce the environmental impact. What you're really after here, and this is why forage is in terms of the overall forage system, you've got to be able to get enough of in the, in the diet to make a difference. And you start thinking about how you might get uh, trees and forages, which you actually ha might have to harvest or could be coppiced in some way and actually feed them to an animal. Can you actually get enough of that growing on your dairy farm without actually impinging on the production of the rest of the farm and, can, and therefore enough in the diet to make a difference? That is where trees and forages may have a limitation on dairy farms. They may have advantages for other reasons, such as in um, summer dry areas, uh, erosion control, and things like that. And they're, they're pretty powerful tools. Okay? But in the New Zealand dairy industry, it's that question around, can you actually get enough of it and feed enough to them? Great question. Okay. Brian, you started off tonight um, describing New Zealand as a small player globally yeah. in terms of milk production. No, no, I said a large player globally. Globally. 35%, but, but small. In, but in terms of global milk production, there's obviously small, huge players and, and most of it being consumed domestically. Yep. And you also, um, during your talk, talked to, used this phrase nitrogen use efficiency a lot. Yeah. And we've heard mostly about New Zealand tonight, but how do our, our um, brothers and sisters overseas in terms of milk production fear when we compare them to New Zealand in terms yeah. of end use efficiency. And on that relative scale, how is New Zealand placed um, for the future in terms of um, being using it inefficiently to produce dairy products? Okay. So, so on a comparative scale, if you look at nitrogen use efficiency in animals, so that's the amount of nitrogen that is going in, in feed, um, and looking at how much is actually going down the product, compared to particularly North American and European based systems based on totem expressions, we're actually quite a bit lower. So our dairy cows are often have a figure about say 25 to 35% at best of the nitrogen going in that actually ends up going into milk. And the total mixed ration systems that operate overseas where they have greater control of the diet, that number would be regularly say 35% is higher. The reasons why it's higher is that they can control the nitrogen concentration of the diet. So because they cut the feed, they mix it, they combine it together, they control how much nitrogen the animal actually, or protein she actually consumes. And because of that, they get lower concentration of nitrogen in the diet. So coming back to the figure that a cow might only need 2.8% in, they are in a great ability to do balancing of the diet for amino acids and things like that. Their nitrogen use efficiency is quite a bit higher than us. Okay. Because we base it on foragers in New Zealand and because we graze outside, it's far harder to do that diet balancing in that situation and much more challenging than a total mixed ration system. So if we put our cows in a barn in New Zealand, 
cut the forage and feed it up and we deliver them an accurate diet, their nitrogen use efficiency would be higher. But is that the system of production that will actually arrive in New Zealand and from an infrastructure and cost point of view they're actually achieved? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Good um, you told us that it's possible to reduce the impact on environment per farm using the technology. But can we look at it at a larger level and if we want to uh, have our international obligations fulfilled, <laughs> Then, like you know, 5 million cows over 1.8 million hectares, when are we going to say enough? What's your opinion? Okay, really interesting. It's a good question. And think about it in two ways, like, or, or look at it this way. If we say that we might be able to develop systems production with fewer cows and requiring less area to actually. Um, to actually feed those cows on and produce the same amount of profit but with lower nitrogen impact. The crucial question you think about is that what happens to, to that land that you leave over? Okay, left over. So we lose the Lincoln versus Demonstration Farm, we use 20% less land to produce roughly the same amount of milk at the same profit with, and have a lower environmental impact. But what do we do in that 20% of land? Do we allocate it to another dairy farm, which would just enhance our environmental footprint? Do we allocate it to an arable farm? Do we allocate it to a, a vegetable production with really high environmental footprint? Those are some really important questions that actually contribute to the total footprint that we actually have. In answering the question on a global scale, like um, our contribution to particularly the greenhouse gases is relatively small um, on an, an international scale because we have a, a, a small sector. But because we have livestock, uh, livestock are our most significant contributors to that. So we must carry on trying to reduce those emissions here within New Zealand and show commitment to those international agreements that we have. Um, Grant, um, New Zealand imports 2 million tonnes or thereabouts of palm kernel expeller annually. Um, a major player in the farming industry has announced that they wish to reduce the consumption of this product. Uh, whilst it might not apply to our local Lincoln farm that much, um, two million tons of palm kernel expeller is roughly double the tonnage of all the grain produced in New Zealand. Um, seeing that palm kernel expeller is reasonably high in protein uh, or nitrogen content compared to some of the high carbohydrate grains, high energy. Could you comment perhaps on substitution and the possibility of moving towards locally <laughs> produced supplements versus imports and its sustainability? Um, okay, excellent question. I personally would like to see a far greater integration between the dairy sector and say the arable sector in New Zealand. Um, we have some integration. Um, already and that would obviously be the pathway that you would have to track down if you're getting the substitution of say removing palm kernel expeller uh, which is what you were talking about and substituting it with something else. You could also argue just sort of done with linked demonstration farm that there might be a pathway of not actually needing anything at all and actually concentrate on what we are actually very good here in New Zealand is having a diet that is pretty much entirely made up of pasture of stuff that we grow particularly well and actually using that to drive our milk production and being very efficient in how we do that. So what it might actually see as an outcome of that decision might actually make us recognise what we are very good at which is pasture management, growing grass, pasture systems and harvesting that really effectively to produce our milk. And perhaps reducing some of the reliance on board and supplements from our side. It's not saying that we might not have to substitute it with something else. There is a range of other products we might substitute it with. It might be grain, it might be fodder bed, it might be maize. The little technologies that we have here currently. Okay, I've got more questions to a close, and I thank you all for your participation in that question session. I think it's um, 
enabled us to get a great insight into the dairy industry, but also into the breadth of knowledge that a professor has to have to be able to cope with the questions that come at them at the end of the session. <laughs> Well, I hadn't quite got to that part, but I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Grant, I just wanted to congratulate you on um, your, your presentation tonight and also on your career and the progress that you've made. Um, from my perspective, you've moved from the front end of a sheep to the back end of a cow. So I'm not sure how far that is, but um, it's really important for Lincoln to be seen and to be involved in the issues that are facing Canterbury, the South Island, the New Zealand and the international environment. And Grant and his team at the Lincoln University um, Research Farm and in conjunction with the demonstration farm are doing that and he indicated um, the success of that in, in the, the tool that it's um, providing, the, the information that it's providing out there. And at the university we're obviously engaged in ensuring that our students are learning how to live well and protect the future <coughs> and um, we're, Grant is very much at the forefront of ensuring the undergraduates get the information, receive the information so they can go from here and take that information and put it on the farm. It's not an easy thing to transfer new information and therefore um, the pipeline that you've identified for us is, is really important and I think over the next decade we'll see the, the um, impact of that work. So I'd get you to join me in, in thanking and congratulating Grant on his professorial work. I just uh, wanted to indicate our, our next um, address is What's eating the potatoes? So we're, we're changing topics completely. I'm just grabbing my notes to check out when the, um, the date of that is. It is the 15th of September. And uh, the 15th of September we have tomorrow's change makers. So our, challenge, our global challenge scholars will be talking. And um, we look forward to seeing you for that. And then on the 30th of September we have the Honourable uh, Nick Smith as he discusses the state of... Um, New Zealand's environment, and I think many of you will be interested in that from the questions that we've had today. And on the 6th of October, we have our fifth Changemaker series from Professor Richard uh, Falou, which is what's eating all our potatoes. So um, we thank you for your attendance tonight and hope to see you again at some of those other opportunities. Thank you.